Good evening. If anybody would like to speak at open session, there's a sign up sheet there for public forum.
Good evening, everyone. This is the one time of year I get to gavel us in. Uh, welcome to the school board meeting tonight. We want to welcome those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are joining us on our YouTube live. Uh, tonight, the reason I'm gaveling in is because we have to have board elections. And so I'm going to present the slate of officers. Each year, the Board of Trustees must elect board officers, including a chair, a vice chair, and a secretary. This year, the board has worked to develop a slate of officers, and tonight, the members will vote on each one of the positions separately. First, the chair. The chair presides over the public board meetings and executive session. He meets or she meets uh, with the superintendent monthly to set the board agenda, acts as the official spokesperson or ancillary meeting representative when needed, mediates conflicts that may arise with board members, and signs the superintendent's travel contract and evaluation. The board this year has nominated Matt McCarter to be the 2021-22 board chair. Do I have any other nominations at this time? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? No. Nope. All right, then the motion carries. Mr. McCarter will be chair. The vice chair of the board operates in the chair's role for any of the aforementioned duties when the chair is unavailable. The vice chair is responsible for participating in the chairman training through the school boards association so that they are ready to step in when needed. This year, the board has nominated Ginger Marr as the 21-22 vice chair. Do I have any other nominations at this time? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? All right. Motion carries. 
The secretary of the board decide, signs documents on behalf of the board, edits public meetings, the board notes taken by the clerk, Ms. Spencer, fills in for the clerk in taking the meeting minutes when she is out, sends thank you notes or other correspondences on behalf of the board. This year, the board has nominated Jessica Cody as the 2021-22 secretary. Do I have any other nominations at this time? Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Thank you very much. There are also three volunteer positions that are needed each year, including a legislative liaison, clover leaf representative, and an all on board representative. These positions do not require a board vote. Tonight, the following individuals have agreed to serve in these voluntary roles. For legislative liaison, it's Tracy Stiff. For um, all on board and clover leaf, Ms. Sherry Curley. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Again, welcome everyone. Appreciate you taking the time to be here. Florida School District Board meets formally twice a month on the second, fourth Monday, one week session and one business board meeting. Tonight's business meeting will follow the approved agenda, which is presented on the district's website under board docs. Also a hard copy is available. If an individual wishes to speak during the public forum, that person will need to register with Mr. Brian Dillon, who tonight is back behind the, um, Terminal there. Each individual will have a maximum of three minutes with a total public forum of 30 minutes. The board chair will provide the rules for the public forum. We have also provided a visual as to the allotted time remaining for each speaker. Following the public forum, the meeting will continue with the remaining presentations per the agenda. If you would, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the invocation. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and there is all with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to start our meeting in gratitude for you and the many gifts you've given us from our students to our teachers to our administrators to the general public who have taken the time to join us today, either here live and in person or virtually. We appreciate the gifts and we hope to use them to the betterment as you would have them do in your heavenly name amen thank you mr Cullet. three items for approval without an objection the board will approve agenda as presented saying no objection tonight's agenda is approved without objection the board will approve minutes as presented saying no objections tonight's minutes are also approved without objection the board will approve personnel as presented in executive session so no objection, personnel as presented is approved. Dr. Quinn, recognitions. The room is packed full of people. That means we've got some very, very special people to recognize tonight. So we're gonna start out with our clay shooting team. You'll come forward. Congratulations to the Clover High School clay shooting team, which finished second in the state as a team. In addition to the team accolades, individual team members earned plaudits for their performance in the competition. Gabrielle Walters was the top shooter, earning first place of all female shooters, while Cheyenne Roberts and Cora Denny were third and fourth among our female participants. Can you three kind of wait, raise, wave, and are you here? Yeah. All right. And then for the gentlemen, Alex Dixon and AJ Dover were the top male shooters for the Blue Eagles, and they finished tied for fourth place. Let's give a round of applause for our clay shooting team. I like the uniforms. <laughs> it's good to see you. Yeah. It's not great. Sorry. Now look at me. First man on picture days. It's okay. Great job, everybody. Appreciate our, our coaches and our team members. 
Next up, uh, Darius Bowser and Jai Martin, our Shrine Bowl selections. Are either of these two gentlemen able to join us tonight? Yes, awesome. I thought Darius might be at basketball. Well, let me read about him anyway. Congratulations to Clover High School senior football players Darius Bowser and Jai Martin for being selected to the 2021 South Carolina versus North Carolina Shrine Bowl. Darius and Jai were chosen as representatives for the state of South Carolina. Unfortunately, the game will not be played this year due to protocols, but it is great to have two of our student athletes recognized among the very best in the state. Congratulations. And last but not least, Wayne Williams engineering class, if you will all come forward and Mr. Williams as well. And we're going to get to see more of these young people tonight, but we're going to go ahead and honor them now. Congratulations to Mr. Williams engineering class for winning first place in the train technology stadium of the future design contest in conjunction with Car the Carolina Panthers. Congratulations to Mr. Williams and his students. We will hear more from them later, but let's give them a huge round of applause now. Do we have any representative from train here? Will you, would you come forward as well? We want to thank our partners with train to come forward and take a picture with us and, and, and give us maybe a few words. No, uh, on behalf of train, um, we appreciate you uh, accepting the uh, honor to take part uh, uh, in the uh, com competition. Uh, sustainability and reducing waste is a huge concern for all of us. And uh, I can see it when I came over early when they brought the model in, the excitement in their faces on um, not only winning, but I think they enjoyed this process. And we hope that it encouraged you and inspired you, but also that you had a, a lot of fun and enjoyed doing it. I know it took a lot of time and energy in your part. So um, on behalf of Train, congratulations to you all. And um, you moving forward in your uh, STEM education program. Thank you very much. Now that does conclude our recognitions, but I will tell you, if you want to stick around for their presentation, I have a feeling it's going to be great. They're going to show us their model. So, but if you do need to go, this is a good time. If you need to make family dinners and do some homework, we understand. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do just do Okay. And there's plenty of seats if you want to relax. Everyone move up to the front. Let's go. Everybody, Mr. Lee. All right. Excellent agenda, Mr. Dillon. Do we have anyone signed up for public forum? Thank you. As Mr. Jenkins is stepping up, we'll go over the um, the rules for. But we got to keep him in check. <laughs> Any individual desire to speak must sign and give his or her name, address the group, and and any um, person that he or she represents. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Groups making a presentation to choose one spokesman to address the board. It is not necessary for others to repeat the same ideas, but they may add something that is pertinent. Speakers may only address school operations and programs during public forum. The board will not hear personal complaints about school personnel or persons connected with the school system in public session. Persons appearing before the board are reminded as a point of information that board members are without authority to act independently as individuals in official matters. Thus, questions may be directed to members, but answers must be deferred pending consideration by the board. The board will receive public forum presentations as items of interest and will take no formal action on these matters, nor will it participate in a debate concerning these matters. Board members may ask questions or respond to matters for the purpose of clarification. Mr. Beal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. 
And uh, I come for a couple of reasons, but first of all, I want to say how much I appreciate you, board members and administration. It's been a difficult two years. I know on you. I probably said this to you in private, but I, I want to say it publicly that I appreciate the leadership job that you have done for this district in two years that have been from you know where. And I appreciate that. And also the teachers. I can't say enough about teachers. As you know, I like to be in schools, whether I'm legal or not, but and visit schools and classrooms, and teachers are working hard. And I feel for them. And let's pat them on the back every chance we get because of the job that they're doing. And I appreciate them and I appreciate you. Now, with all those accolades, there always comes up the but, right? But so my but is, is about the capital improvement plan. And I guess the speed with which I believe we're moving or resolving that through the meetings and the survey. Um, I realize we have needs to be met, but I'm not sure doing all the meetings in one week at a time when people are thinking about holidays and holiday events and things like that, that this is at the top of their list. So uh, I'm a little concerned about getting feedback at a time like this and why we're addressing that. The second thing was a survey, and I'm sure these techie people will have a smart answer for me, and that's all right. But I went on first of last week to take the survey, and guess what? I was locked out. He said I had taken the survey before on a day I was in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. I tried the next day. It didn't work. I was locked out. I talked to at least four other people Wednesday or Thursday. They tried and were locked out. I got on on Friday and took the survey. And I was so overjoyed that I took twice. So <laughs> you can my phone. Thank you, so I love them. And when they don't put a safety precaution on there, I try them. I've, I've done these things if you know them. Other roles that I've been in for ASCD and others for really mm -hmm. you got to put a lock on these people. But they locked me out before I took it, but they didn't lock me out after I took it. So that's it. Uh, I say that because, you know, I support this district. There's no question about that. You know how much I care about the students of this district. And I say what I say because I care about the district. And I voted for it the last time. I'll vote for it the next time because I believe in this school system. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jenkins? Mr. Jenkins? Yes. Did your friends get to take, ever get onto the survey to take it? I haven't talked to them since then. I would assume they did. I, I think it was a little, little glitch, and I don't know if it was bad for the last survey, and that's what it was. But all of us got locked out on 11 10 at like 10 28, some strange morning time. Yeah, the initial survey link was a single sign on survey. So once one person took it, it was everybody else was locked. That was a mistake on the company's part. When we called them about it, they fixed it. It was a, it was a separate. Yeah. So I apologize you had that experience. And to anyone else who had that experience. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. This concludes uh, tonight's public um, session of public forum. Mr. Love, finance and facilities report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Let's get pretty quickly. I see you. And share several things with you in the last one. Proof of a couple of things. The items of sharing is that if you look on the financial information I sent, the receipts and disbursements through this last week were there. Nothing is out of the line as far as the present time is concerned. Of course, it's a little hard to tell based on what the revenue stream will be. Since we are just now getting the tax of that, it'll be after the first of the year and before we have an idea of what the collection rate is. Typically, our district will collect somewhere about 98, 99% of the taxes bill, but it's been the first, first of the calendar year before we have a good idea of how many dollars we're dealing with. It. We have a list of items in there, uh, which we're identifying as surplus property. And we ask you to approve that as surplus so we can go through the bidding process and dispose of this. You can remember we did this again last uh, spring. We got rid of a number of items and 
made about a little over $400,000 on sales of surplus property last year, which helped offset the shortfall we were in with the interest income since we had overestimated interest based upon the previous year and the interest rates were substantially lower during this last year. We are going through our school and picking up some things. Got two pages worth of a variety of items. They have been offered to our principals. So if they have seen some things that, that they can use before we dispose of it, uh, they have told us back that we're ready to go and we will have additional items in the future. As an example, we have ordered some new cafeteria tables for several schools. So when they come in, we'll need to move those. And we're already asking for permission on that even though we don't have the numbers or the number it is a lead yet. So as soon as they come in, since we have ordered your tables, we'll be able to move that out without further action. But we'll come back again in the spring when the school's over and have additional items that the schools will identify that we cannot uh, use anymore. So at this point, we would ask for a motion or approval to uh, dispose of this list of surplus items. Any other additional questions for Mr. Love on this item? That objection the board will approve, appro will approve the surplus property as um, stated by Mr. Love. We have a number of audits and this last summer we had a procurement audit. The state requires those of us who expend $65 million or more a year to have a separate special audit of which the auditors have to follow specific rules identified by the state. And they have special questions to ask and they look for certain things. This happens to be statewide, it's not just selected for us. We had one item that they found in there this year that they suggested that we do something about. And it's it's called and the problem is when folks don't follow the rules on the procurement, we're supposed to make some documentation regarding that and put it in the final so we can determine what has happened and why we did certain things. It's very much like when we send you a report each year of sole source or emergency provisions. Those are things that come outside the normal procurement rules. And that's what we're supposed to do is provide you with a list of those things that come outside the normal procurement processes. What they've asked us to do is to prepare a, a form, an official form uh, that we put with it, that we identify those things, identify what we did, why we did, what we're going to do to make sure that it uh, does not happen again. We've been documenting it with a little informal kind of thing to put it in, but now they, they, they want us to use it. And I put a sample form in the report that you look at, that you can look at and see what it says. It's called uh, an unauthorized procurement ratification. It's a ratification form and it's identified in the procurement rules that we have to follow to ratify things. You'll notice it's basically who, what, where, when, and why. But in the future, we'll, we'll be a little bit more formal in our communication. They didn't block us over the head to do anything about like that. They don't they don't um, penalize us anyway. It's one of those things that we need to make you aware that we've got to do a little better job. So we're, seeing, we're putting that form in for your information to know where we are. We have also just about finished the annual financial audit as of June 30th. And the audit will be finished and we're going to send in by December 1st. That's the law requires that by the legislature. We can't move it. Uh, the legislature is the only one that can move it. This year, we turned that in, in a very good situation. We have ended up, uh, our actual revenue is over budget by $4.3 million. Now, 1.6 of that came from taxes. We can and wine, we're all in good shape in terms of tax collection because the assessment data we used last June in making the budget turned out much lower budget wise than it turned out actual wise. And everybody's collecting more taxes. But that, that's good in the sense that we have money. It doesn't look good in the sense that we were living a mill or two that we didn't need. But you know, we, we levy our taxes based upon the assessment that the county tax assessor gives us. We don't have anything to do with that. So they give us a number of a dollar. We use that dollar and mathematically calculate where we need to make to make our budget balance. It's a number that changes every year. We've been very blessed in the last few years 
and that the nuclear plant and our assessment is gradually growing. We're up to about 390 million now in terms of the overall assessment for debt service and a little over 200 million for normal operations. And I would suspect that the way things are going, and this is a real problem with the nuclear plant assessment, they'll hit 400 million in the not too distant future for debt service payments. Mr. Love, question on that. How much does growth have to do with this, any surplus we had in the revenue? Growth on students mm -hmm. is down the line. I'll, I'll get there in just a minute. Okay. I'm going to note there. Thank you for reminding me. Make sure I get there. The state revenue is over budget this year by 2.5 million. That's caused by a couple of things. One is the growth of students that we experienced that we didn't know we were going to have in public time. And we get a certain amount of money for each student. We also received more money from the state than we expected at budget time. There are always some extra uh, allocations that come along, some extra grants that are allowed us to move some expenses from the general fund into that uh, special revenue fund so that we end up with more money in the general fund side where we normally do our budget. But uh, the growth help us a lot. State money help us a lot. So that end up, when we put those two together, about 4.3 million over budget in the general fund. Now on the expense side of the house, we're under by 1.7 million. That, that represents a couple of things. One is management and managing what we spend when to try to make sure we stay within the overall budget allocation. But you're not supposed to spend over what the board allocates and approves each year unless we come back for board approval. And as Sheila has done that a couple of times over the year because we needed a few more slots to take care of the number, again, the numbers of students and look at more students, more growth. Some of our programs ran only a partial year, also resulting in a lower actual expense versus budget. We had some things due to COVID that put things off. We had some problems with supply. And if you remember, uh, we had some problems and we delayed doing some things. For example, painting, floor covering, things like that, that we normally would have paid that had to be shifted. Now, the same thing happened the previous year, but we didn't get to finish some of those things because of the impact of COVID. But as you put those two together, we had about $6 million of excess dollars, excess revenue, of which we were able to allocate to the building fund in accordance with prior board policy, $5 million over there into the building fund for future capital needs. And we added a million dollars to the general fund operating unallocated balance, unappropriated balance, fund balance, you'll hear a number of people talk about. That allows us to stay within the course goal of 25 percent of our next year's budget as an unappropriated fund balance and that allows us to pay things on a, on a timely basis not have to go through a short-term tax anticipation though process all of those things that, that we hear about regularly and also to advance monies on behalf of the federal projects very few federal projects give money for us to spend on the front end we have to advance the money which takes our caddy which uses that unappropriated fund balance, and then we get reimbursed. And the vast majority of the extra money are basis on a, a reimbursement process. So the, the auditors will share that with you in more detail with the final reports in that next appropriate meeting, probably going to be January. But these are the numbers that you can be prepared. We have a draft that, that we're prepared to be kind of copied, things like that. And we'll electronically send it to the State Department and the Bureau of Census and other federal agencies that we're supposed to send briefing uh, deadlines. If you recall, the last Mr. Rowe, can I ask you a question? You mentioned a reference to TANS money, um, which is the, your tax anticipation note. When is the last time Florida School District was in a position where they were not able to fund payroll and had to go out and borrow? 2001, 2002. We had to borrow money in July in order to meet the payroll expenses of January. And we started working on that then. Bob Dameron was sharing to show a few things about it. He helped us get out of that hole. 
Is there a number that you are you aware of as far as district across the state who are in a different situation than Clover School District would be in? That's having to use TAN? Oh, yes. There are several numbers, and, and uh, Bob works with about 40 across the state. He can tell you there are several when he gets here of numbers. Yeah, the numbers of people still have to do that. We have um, the night. Bob Dameron and Franny Hauser, Bob Barson's son, coming through district advisors. They're a company that's financial advisors that works with a number of districts across the state. If we go to the market to issue bonds, we're required to have these kinds of folks as an independent entity review what we do in order that the bondholders are secure in getting that. Franny Hauser works with the old McNair Law Firm and works with Byron Thorman now, has done a lot of work. With school district refinancing and all, we ask them to come tonight to share with you information about refinancing. So we feel it's now time that we get a free to proceed down the list. But the things to do to refinance the 15 bonds that we issued some years back. There are about 60 some million dollars of those outstanding and watches the market very closely. Brandon works with them, and we'll ask them to share a few things about what they need to do and where they need to be. And then when we finish, we ask for your approval if you see fit to uh, proceed down the line for mm -hmm. refinancing uh, these last bonds outstanding. It's not appropriate to leave on the short term bonds to those with about six, eight years left, but then other ones are out where it's uh, appropriate to carefully consider. So if I can, may allow them to come forward and Welcome, Bob. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. <laughs> this is a calculation of the savings that we would make. Pass that around, please. A lot of Ken is passing those out. Uh, he and I actually were talking about uh, 20, 20 years ago when you had to issue a tax investigation. The, the general funds allowance we've gotten so small over the year that uh, it's two things. One, it impacted uh, the added cost of having issue as hand, but it also impacted your bond rate. And uh, over the years, as we've issued, and I think the last time when we issued uh, the 2015s, which were refunded bonds from previous, uh, the district actually received a ratings increase from. Uh, movies of S and P and so you're a double A degree uh, rating, and part of that is because you have a strong fund balance. Uh, it's slow. the same way as if you went in individually and go into your banker and you want to borrow money. You know, if you don't have much net worth, your interest rate's going to be a lot higher because the risk is greater. Same way in the bond market, and so have a strong fund balance is really critical to the district's overall financial health and, and a recommendation to. From the rating agencies to people who purchase your debt, that it's safe and it's secure, and that you have a strong financial backing. So, maintaining that strong fund balance is really, really a critical factor. Uh, the reason we're here tonight is to talk about refunding the 2014 bonds. Um, the sheet that Ken just passed out is an example of what. Uh, the prior bonds and payments would be the new bonds payments would be and then in the green column for money is the net savings as you see we're estimating about four hundred and thirty thousand dollars of annual savings and interest costs that you won't have to pay uh in in future years uh the reason that the first year is small is the big payments basically happen in march or april and so these won't be really sold and and close you know, sometime in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, so you won't have a lot of savings in March of 2022, but those savings will come in place in March of 23 through the maturity in March of 2034. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty conservative estimate. Uh, it's similar to what uh, four other school districts uh, have done in the last month and a half. It's uh, uh, one, Richland two, uh, Dorchester Tech and Buford have all been in the market selling similar to the same thing you're doing with about the same 
uh, maturity. Um, and in all those cases, they got from the beds of 2% or less. So we felt like that the 2% figure, which is what we're estimating and showing you all tonight, should be representative of what you'll get. But we're hoping to keep the across based on the market. Uh, what they'll be, but we actually go to market what, what that rate will be. So I anticipate uh, the delay will be a little bit less than that, but I want to give you a figure that we think is fair and uh, very conservative. That's how we always produce these documents. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. These bonds will be competitively bid. Uh, it's not a single source deal of anybody gets in the paper. They're all competitive with it. They're usually on the market uh, and on the street, Randy, about three weeks uh, or Folks have plenty of time. It's a great time for us to be going to market because Ken's got a new audit that's this done as of June 30. Uh, so that's always a benefit. School district or banks like to see current audits uh, and withdraw from fund balance, strong capital funds that you have as well. Please do this big piece of bonds to speak very, very aggressively. So I'm glad to answer any questions if you have any. Franny can talk about the legal aspects of the of the uh, resolution. I don't I don't know if you pinpoint it exactly, but as far as the board and the audience, we're all in here taxpayers. Just the anticipated savings from refinancing these bonds. I'd say the total savings is a little over five million dollars, uh, with an average of about four hundred thirty thousand. Yeah, and then the net present value, which is we'll take those savings over a period of time and back lower than what the net present value would be is about four point five. So it's a substantial savings to the taxpayers uh, that's great to the uh, paying for the savings. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Quinn, it's great to be with y'all. Uh, I'm driving up from Columbia and the leaves and everything were so pretty and it's cold outside. So it's actually starting to feel like winter is here. So uh, it, was, it was a very pleasant trip up. Um, y'all have in front of you a resolution that needs to be adopted uh, in order to proceed with refunding or refinancing as described by, um, by Mr. Dameron. Uh, this document basically delegates to your superintendent the authority to make specific decisions regarding the sale of the bonds. For example, uh, the flexibility is there for this bonds to be sold as taxable debt or tax exempt debt. Uh, we can sell these bonds with a, a credit rating, but we can sell them competitively to banks. Uh, we are thinking now that the current thought is that this would be. Uh, that this debt would be sold via an RFP to banks. And so, um, and uh, so it probably would not need a credit rating, would not have to go through that process. Under state law, all general obligation debt has to be publicly sold. So we will publish a notice in um, part of the state newspaper uh, to put everybody on notice that the um, sale is going to occur. It might be, the sale might be before the end of the calendar year. The closing probably would not be before the end of the calendar year. And based on advice from Compass and um, considerations from Mr. Love, we might do the sale early in January. So those are really some of the options that, that we will be working through on y'all behalf. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have about the resolution. Okay, great. Thank y'all. Thank you. Do you want to call for the approval? We do not request that you go and approve the resolution that authorizes the superintendent to proceed with the refunding of the 14 bonds. Any additional questions for Mr. Love? Okay, without objection, the board will approve to move forward with refinancing of the 2004 bond as presented. Do we see any objections? No objection. No, no objections, and it approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have today. Thank you, Mr. Love. Thank Dr. Quinn. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Be safe. Getting home. We have one more, maybe what the audience might consider not so fun report before we get to the good stuff. So hang in there. Um, I need to do an update to the board at, per your request on our capital planning projects. And so I have uh, several things to update you on. First, in October, 
Uh, the board began live streaming its board meetings on YouTube live since then. It might interest you to know we've had 442 community members who viewed our board meetings via that way. And that's good because that's a big part of our transparency plan going forward to ensure the community that we are doing the work of the community, especially as we're planning the capital projects going forward. As you know, we've also released the survey. We've heard Mr. Jenkins and others talk about the survey, and we just completed a listening tour last week uh, on November 16th, 17th, and 18th. The survey is still open. If you have not had a chance to take it, it's open through November the 30th, and it's not a single sign-on link now, so you can actually complete the survey. So sorry about the confusion on that. Um, we thank our churches who hosted us last week. Uh, we were able to hear directly from about 50 community members who took the time to join us, and we thank them for their uh, thoughts and times and questions. And we are going to be having a town hall on January the 20th, 2022, uh, where we give the information from the listening tours, the information from the survey, as well as answer the questions that the community posed at the listening session. So please uh, mark your calendars for January the 20th at 6.30 p.m. in our auditorium, and we will be presenting that information along with our new 45-day enrollment report and the results of our walking through every single building again to look at utilization and capital or, or capacity in our buildings. Um, in your board package, board members and community in board docs, which we are going to do, uh, we've, we've actually recorded a video recording of how you find information on board docs, but you can go in board docs and you can find a list, and that list is posted up now, of all of the meetings that the board conducted between March 2019 and October 2021 related to capital projects planning. The board had 28 presentations and discussions and work sessions and business meetings to prepare for the bond presentation. These were, are all available on board docs, but to make it even easier, we're gonna post the list that you see in the facilities section of our website. So you go under the departments and click on facilities, you'll see this list and there will be an active link to every presentation, the board, every report the board viewed with regard to our capital planning. In terms of our short-term next steps, um, I would like to propose to the board that the district use the architecture firm Jumper Carter Cease, which we procured back in February 2020, to provide us with an updated cost estimate for renovations at Bethany Elementary School. The board may remember that Jumper Carter was the architecture firm that we procured to provide us with estimations on renovation projects uh, outlined in the bond. In November, the district was able to enter into an agreement to purchase the land beside Bethany Elementary School, and we're still in that process now. Acquiring this property will allow the district to consider a more robust renovation of Bethany, which we have presented to the board conceptually, but we've never given you a full updated cost estimation, estimation excuse me, for the additional uh, renovations. Uh, Bethany renovations for the audience here could include the original four classrooms and the expansion of the cafeteria that was originally planned in the bond referendum, but it could also include expanding the traffic stacking off of Maynard Grayson Road and onto the um, property that we now own. It can provide some needed parking for staff and parents and visitors. It could expand and move the playground and make it ADA accessible for students with physical disabilities and for our pre-K students who are having to navigate stairs to get down to that playground, which is not very safe. And it can also create a walking area around the playground for the Bethany community. We would like to, with the board's approval tonight, and this is not a, a vote approval, but with your agreement, be able to bring you those cost estimate, estimations sorry, by January. Do, I have, do you have any concerns about that? No, nope. all right, we will proceed. And that is the update on our capital projects. <clears throat> and now for the fun stuff. Yeah. Superintendent's report tonight. We're going to first hear from our uh, Clover High School pre-engineering program. I uh, will ask our students to come forward and uh, show us a little bit about the presentation that got you first place in the train competition. So welcome. Mm 
we're getting a bad view. And board members, if you want to get a better view, I know Ms. Curlick does. You're welcome to walk around and sit. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Wilson Grice. I'm here today with uh, John Perry. We have the honor tonight of giving you the same presentation that we gave to Carolina Sanders and Kenny Technologies for the Kenny Technologies Stadium of the Future um, STEM Challenge. So, the premise of this challenge was to build an NFL style stadium for our high school that could fit 70,000 people that was energy efficient and environmentally sustainable. So, with that being said, let's take a look at Clover Memorial Stadium. So, a large part of our stadium and our design was to incorporate uh, lots of modern technology. And we did that by incorporating mainly the, uh, the large jumbotron at the end of the field. Um, we also included a Wi-Fi network, however, for anyone who was, um, you know, attending the game. And that uh, we do have a functional prototype of that working. So there is a Wi-Fi network um, up right now. Uh, also, we uh, included plenty of places for placement of ribbons, uh, ribbon boards on the front of the bleachers, and we also had a big focus on efficiency and energy efficiency. Specifically. So for our main lighting. We want to use all LEDs because they are so much more power efficient than incandescent and halogen. And for our accent lighting, we decided to go with electroluminescent wire, which is rather dim, but it is a lot more efficient than even LEDs. And so we also incorporated lots of safety features into our stadium to make sure that all of our guests would be protected and safe during all games. Uh, one of those features would be that we would incorporate the jumbotron into our emergency exit procedures so that everyone could see very clearly what they need to do in the event of an emergency. And also there would be audio cues as well with that. We also include uh, guest relations offices to take care of any uh, difficulties that any of our attendees are uh, experiencing. And we have, we'd like to incorporate trans security personnel as well. And we also incorporated easy access to our entrances and exits through this space behind the bleachers. That would be where our uh, doors would be. And we want to incorporate metal detectors at every entrance as well for the safety of our guests. So one of the big portions of this project was for the stadium to be both sustainable and energy efficient. So when we began uh, researching this project, a lot of the clean energy sources that we found were things like solar and wind, ener wind energy, but we decided that these were not the most um, reliable sources for a stadium that would need to produce a lot of energy. So we decided since Lake Wiley is right down the road, why not put the stadium on Lake Wiley and take advantage of that uh, natural resource and use hydroelectric energy. So if you take a look at our stadium, we actually have a dam right here that would produce um, the energy for our stadium. And like Josh said, we included LED lighting, which is a lot more efficient than uh, any other type of lighting. We also have a rainwater collection system that would collect, obviously, the rainwater and would be used to irrigate the grass around the field and the grass on the field itself. We also have a zero plastic initiative that, um, so that the vendors inside of the stadium would be forced to use just paper so that it could be recyclable. And then we also, on the outside of our stadium, as you can see, we have trees inside of this which is uh, what we call our indoor environment, which we actually took from train technologies. They have that in a lot of their buildings. So we wanted to make sure that when we use hydroelectricity as our power source, that we would have a positive energy impact and actually generate more green energy than we require to run the stadium. So uh, a typical stadium would, uh, we recently would consume about five or 10 megawatt hours of power during one event. And the average hydroelectric dam produces much more than that, produces about 116,000 megawatt hours of electricity per day. And so our dam, we calculated, would still have a positive net energy impact, even if we used a very small dam compared to traditional ones. Uh, we calculated with just 100 kilowatts as our uh, continuous power output, and still we would end up with more than enough power to power our stadium for a game each week. Thank you. 
Okay, so when we were researching this, we decided that we needed a spot where this could actually be a viable option. So if you can see right here, this is where our stadium would actually be um, if we decided to build it. Our dam would be located right there, and it would be on Highway 274. So the pros to this location is that there's existing moving water, which would be Crowder's Creek, existing infrastructure, which is Highway 274, and this is 226 undeveloped waterfront acres. So inside of our stadium on game days, we have lots of amenities for anyone who attends our games. Uh, one of the biggest ones being the very big Jumbotron. And um, you know we want to incorporate cameras as well so that we can have video feeds of both the field and our guests. Um, we also incorporated an interesting, an interesting um, item as the waterfront in front of our stadium, which is by virtue of our dam, uh, uh, we would have our attendees would be able to actually watch the game from the water if they preferred to do so. Uh, we also wanted to incorporate our complimentary Wi-Fi network, and we have an easy access parking deck uh, very close to the stadium so that our guests will be able to make it into the game and get out very quickly uh, in the event of an emergency and just efficiently after games. We also wanted to incorporate e-tickets as a more efficient way of getting people in and out, uh, having our ticket system be online so that it is you know, much faster than paper tickets. So now for some of the premium services within Clover Memorial Stadium. So the first thing that you see when you look at our stadium is our VIP suites, which are above the first level of our um, bleachers. So these could um, obviously be bought before the game so you can enjoy the game from inside and the air conditioning and have food brought to you. Another thing that we would include is sideline passes where you could purchase one of these and actually watch the game from the sidelines. We also have high speed internet, which could be purchased um, along with your ticket and it would just include better Wi-Fi with quicker speeds. And then the last thing for our premium services is actually something that we came up with. Um, we actually have boats in the water and then we call this a sail gating where you can actually rent the boat and you can watch the game from in the boat. So for the school training, branding and traditions. So the first thing is we obviously we named it Clover Memorial Stadium, which is just like our stadium down the road. And the color scheme of the stadium also matches um, our actual stadium with the aluminum bleachers with the uh, navy on the inside. And if you watch our jumbotron, there will be a moped to Memphis um, branding thing that will come up, which I'll, everybody here knows what moped to Memphis is. And we also have a spot for the Clover Crazies, which as everybody knows is the Palmetto's finest student section. And so along with just our stadium, we wanted to make sure that we kept our community engaged in this new uh, stadium design. So we wanted to make sure we had our stadium at a central location between Clover and Lake Wiley, given that both are part of our district. And um, we also wanted to incorporate some living spaces nearby. So we included the Eagle's Nest Apartments as that uh, red building over by the side. And of course, we wanted to have our parking close to our stadium for efficiency. And we also incorporated advertisements uh, for some of our local businesses. We have ads for the Pizza Man, El Mexicano, Nagoya, and a few others. And so there are references from our research. And we just want to thank you all tonight. Thank you to Train Technologies and the Carolina Panthers for hosting us um, in this competition. Now we see why the number one. Congratulations, thank you guys. <laughs> Sure, doesn't mean what they do. Yeah. She's going to do it like this. All right, moving us along. Okay.
This year, our theme has been Learn, Love, Lead, and I get the very big privilege of being in every school every month, and when I go, I stay about an hour and a half, and I'm always, I always, always stay way too long at Greg's. Every time I'm there, I can't leave the building. There's so much good going on there, and so we invited them tonight to share their Learn, Love, Lead information, so we're going to ask them to come forward now. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate having me here. Good evening. So bear with me. I get a little nervous. I'm used to talking to small people, so when I'm talking to big people, I'm this side. Get a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, we, I got you. <laughs> we're good. Um, but we're so happy to be here. We wanted to share something that's very near and dear to our hearts at Greek Road. We have been on a path on a journey to uh, implement personalized learning at Greg's Road uh, to make our students more successful in learning. And one of the pieces of that that we're focusing on is student data. And we really believe that student data should be students' data and not only teachers' data. Um, allowing students to track their own data throughout their learning process is one of the most important things we can do as our teachers. Students who track their own data are more aware of their learning, more engaged in their learning, become more confident learners, and are more accountable for their learning. And we're going to discuss what this looks like in some of our early childhood classrooms and our upper elementary classrooms with you guys tonight. Uh, I'm Amy Snyder. I teach in fourth grade ELA Social Studies at Griggs Road. And so I'm going to talk about um, from the from the older um, side. So using data to transform our classrooms gives students transparency in their learning. When students know why they are learning something, they can easily track their progress and allows for them to have ownership in their learning. Data tracking also enables students to be aware of their strengths and their weaknesses. By having a visual in the room and and or in their personal data notebooks, students know where they are at all times in their progression of their standards. The visual also motivates students to work hard. For example, we started a unit on writer's craft recently in my classroom. The student got super excited about assessing the standards. I mean, what kid is excited about a test? <laughs> the first day of the unit, and he said, Miss Snyder, Miss Snyder, I can't wait to get, he said, um, I can't wait to get another green sticker on the wall to show that he mastered that sticker. Uh, the green sticker that you will see soon on our data walls in our presentation represents the mastery of that standard. And when kids are excited about taking a test and showing me what they know, that means we're doing something right. Um, the visuals are driving learning with success in our classrooms. As a result, students are excited about working in a great spring. So Nora Teller, I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> All right. uh, I'm Taylor Brooke Cook and I teach first grade at Great Trade. Um, and this is just a couple of pictures of how my students are tracking their data um, in my classroom. Something we've worked really hard this year is our phonics progression, and the kids are tracking their their own phonics progression through our curriculum, and they're moving at their own pace. So we have 36 different pathways that the kids are working through at their own pace, and each pathway is focused on a different phonics skill. So they're tracking the phonics skills you see in the top left. They're putting stickers as they complete the activities, and they're also being pulled for direct instruction during this time as well. And then on the very right over there, they're putting a sticker on the chart there. And so they can see how many phonics um, skills that they mastered and how many they still have to go. And then you can also see our data wall for trophies. Um, we celebrate the kids, and when they master something, they get put stickers on their trophies. It was a big celebration every Friday afternoon. And we're tracking a couple of things on those donuts there as a class goal. And then you can see an example of our app and report card in the middle the notebook. And we've turned our standards into I can statements. And the kids are tracking their own learning on these I can report cards. And these are also going home for traditional report cards. And instead of the traditional report card, these are giving students and parents a better idea of where they're struggling and where their strengths are, rather than just giving one grade. 
vacancy in kind of what area and region or what area and that that they have from the internet that they still need to work on. So these are just all the ways that we're doing that. Okay, so Ms. Terry and I are a team at Rick's Road, and we both have data walls in our rooms. If you look on the right, that's what we have um, on our walls. So that all, all, all the way down the left is all the standards that we learn. And this is a map of Mount Montsperry School in ELA. So we say, you know, the end of the year, these are all of the skills that you need to be proficient in by the end of the year to be totally prepared for fifth grade. So we, um, Direct instruction, have an assessment, you know, teach them, do a lot of practice, have an assessment, and if they get, um, if they master it at grade level, they get a green sticker. So that's what my student was talking about with the green sticker. And um, have they going to tell you a little bit more about what all the other other colors mean? Um, and then on the left, we have these individual data tracker notebooks, and we do learning long time in both of our classes a couple times a week. Where they know exactly what standard they need to work on. They written up, they have written a smart goal for that standard, and they just have some time to play games or do activities to practice to maybe retake that, retake that standard or try to master it. Because um this series will talk about this, but we are not so concerned about when they master the standard as long as they master or they do this. We have all year to master these skills. And I didn't, you know, I did pass my driver's test the first time, but some people didn't. And you have to drive, so you have to get back and practice to think again. So kind of like these fourth grade skills, you need to you need to master these skills. Um, and then in the next one. So we celebrate when we master skills. I was sitting down there for a week in fourth grade, we have a mastery bill. Where they get a green or they get a blue, which I think we'll tell you about in a minute. They get to ring the bell for the whole class. Maybe clap for them, maybe cheer for them. And our classes are kind of catty corner. When my class hears her class ring the bell, the worst could be closed. My class cheers because they just know that we're a family. We learn together. Um, this is a way that my classes celebrate them, each other and themselves when they reach a goal. We pop a balloon over their heads and it has confetti in it when they master a math skill. Um, and then you can, and sometimes I'll even make them figure out the problem on the balloon. And it's just, you know, it's fun. And so we have, we have a little video of an example. It has some slow motion, so it makes it <laughs> That is fun. <laughs> but the kid and the kids have learned, you know, not everybody gets something off that balloon on the first try, and that's okay. And it was a hard lesson at first for these first graders to learn. Oh, I didn't need to pop my balloon today, but they know they have to work hard and don't get to pop the balloon if you didn't put the work if you didn't put in the work and the match that skill. So now they celebrate their friends and they know they need to come back for some extra help and once they master it, they'll get pop. So it's building a strong work ethic that they need for a Because for some students, school is always so easy. And our approach to first line of learning and competency based education at Greeks Road means that those kids don't have to sit through lessons that aren't meaningful for them or that don't challenge them. And uh, for others, and especially those who have been affected by virtual learning, there are significant academic gaps. And these gaps up are only going to get bigger because teachers can't effectively build on foundations that don't, ex don't exist without these tools that build ownership in turn. And for all students, education is meaningful when we are able to meet them where they are in ways to honor who they are. Um, for all the scenarios that we've shared and for all the data and the pictures that have been in the previous slides, there are faces and names of stories that we think of. Um, but I can picture a student this year who's never had a struggle to be successful, who cried her way through a difficult and challenging task to earn a blue sticker, the one that shows that she went above and beyond grade level standards, um, that she understands the material at a deeper depth of knowledge, and she glowed with more pride when she had a struggle than I've ever seen her 
when success was so easy. I can think of another student who doesn't give much effort, who pretends not to care about school, um, but I see the way his eyes light up when he talks about building things with his dad. And so he and I have already made plans for him to lead everyone in the class who has mastered the necessary measurement standards um, in building benches outside of our school. But of course, it requires him to master those skills too. And suddenly he's caring and trying in class. And my last student has never had much academic success um, due to the circumstances outside of her control. Um, she was able to bring the mastery bell to cheers and applause of her classmates, and she passed the standard for the very first time. And it was six weeks later than everyone else passed, she passed that skill. But that success lit a fire within her. And yes, it took her longer than it took her peers. It took her multiple tries and contesting that those things should not matter uh, when our goal is to educate. So the moment you add student ownership to student engagement, you have empowerment. It is the most rewarding moment as a teacher when these students become empowered. And empowerment can't start unless learning is transparent. So we would like uh, for you to hear from a couple of our empowered students, we have first grader, uh, Mason and Carter, and fifth grader, Kelly Dillon. So we are going to start with Ms. Macy Ann is going to talk about her um, individual data notebook that we're keeping in first grade. So I'm going to ask her some questions and kind of get an interview style with her about that. All right, can you stand on what your data notebook is? So, what's something that your notebook tells you that you're really good at? How do you know? What did your notebook tell you about me? Your past three trips, how do you know your past three trips? Really fun. Like, what's something that your dad might look like you need to work on? Is it okay if you need to work on something a little bit more? What in math are we doing? Okay. And how do we celebrate the juice? <laughs> Sometimes it makes a little bit of mess. The team gets upset, but we speak about her. <laughs> what else do we need to do? What do you get from your trip? Candles. And this is the of her life. Amazing, and it's a rough first grade, and that first one I learned. I was last year. I'm just going to tell you what the different colors mean. So, um, it's sort so great is when you master the student race, when you can read the student, you can read the Um, then there's blue. Blue is like the highest you can get to. It's where you, you know it so well that you can even teach it properly. <laughs> and then there's also the yellow, which is like the last It's when you kind of need a little more help or ask a teacher um, and then there's red which means you have a lot to work on. Uh, what different colors did you get last year? I got I got some yellows, I got some um, greens and blues. What were your strengths in that? Um, I was really good at multiplying and dividing the two like What about your weaknesses? Wasn't very good at knowing the different types of fractions. I got a little I was like, 
That was third grade, they learned uh, the fractions. They were introduced to fractions when they were books. So it's a weakness for a lot of students. But how does knowing your weaknesses for grade how that help you in third grade? Well, it helps me because I know, like, oh gosh, I don't really know the standard too well. I'm going to go um, ask my teacher, like, if she can help me work and study at home um, and study and, and practice this. But, mm -hmm. Right, that's, that's a try to be a learning. <laughs> um, as you guys can see, uh, uh, a very proud, silent, proud mama moment. Um, the teachers work hard every single day. I will tell you that COVID has put a lot of strain on teachers, but the one thing that I can tell you, saying mom from the North experience, you're going to see it every single day in every single classroom. So please come join us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Great job, students, and great job, teachers, and great job, principal, too. All right. Also, from Griggs tonight, uh, it just so happened we had already planned to have them do their gifted and talented program. So I'm going to turn it over to Griggs Teachers for Gifted and Talented. So it's a double Griggs. Yes, uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening, everybody. I'm Rose Rigg. I'm the art teacher at Ridge Road Elementary School and the instructor for the um, autistic GT program. And I'm Whitney Hinson. I am the instructor for the GT dance program and a kindergarten instructional assistant. We appreciate this opportunity um, to present a brief overview of, of the unique program that we have been lucky enough to be part of. Um, you often think of gifted and talented as those students who excel at the And then the other students are sort of forgotten about. What is unique about this program is it not only recognizes that gifted to be in other areas and embraces, it gives students a chance to shine. The other thing that's unique about this program is it really supports and connects to um, the staff, the South Carolina graduate, the profile of South Carolina graduate in the, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> um, in the areas of world-class skills and career and um, career characteristics. Because when we're thinking about the profile of the South Carolina graduate, we think about ideas of them being creative, needing to be pushed to be innovative, to think critically, and to problem solve. And in our two programs, they're doing what continues. It is not only a necessary part, it is the essential part. They also are pushed to be self-directed and to believe in their talents. So we have sort of created a brief slideshow um, for the art portion, I interviewed my very shy art students. Some of them did not let me film their entire faces, so it was not a camera fall. They did not. Want. Um, they're going to tell you about their favorite pieces and their favorite things in the art. But I'm going to send some to start with dance, and she can explain her art. Thank you. Hey, all. Um, so the first picture I just want to start with. Um, they had to pick the pictures that make my artwork special to them. So that's why I chose this one. They chose to spell the word dance with their bodies. And that's part of a study that we were working on, which I'll explain a little bit more later. But, yeah. All right, so um, it's very important to remember that dance and any kind of art is a really vulnerable place to be. It's vulnerable for any human being, much less a group of fourth and fifth grade students. And most of them have not had any formal dance training. They actually interview most of their moves to like the latest TikTok trends. So, you know, it's really um, interesting to see what they consider to be dance and then what we know as the classical form. So I came up with three goals um, that I thought would be attainable for our students. And hopefully they would have fun exploring all of these goals. So to expose students to different dance genres with classical and popular styles and educate them on the history and evolution of the styles. To teach the basic fundamentals and establish the foundation of those genres and to facilitate creative expression through movement studies. So here um, I took a few pictures of them learning the ballet fundamentals. Um, these are the first five positions in ballet. So in the top left, we have first, top right, second, bottom left third, bottom right fourth, and then fifth position. And in this slide, there was a video. Um, oh, here you go. 
So in this exercise, they are um, just, they are showing a tondu and a degage exercise. So we want us to really learn the difference between a tondu, which is stretching through the floor, and a degage, which is disengaging from the floor. And while I'm teaching all these, they're learning all the terminology too. So it's really funny to hear them now. Okay, so from there we moved on to positive and negative space and shapes. So this is part of the um, the first picture. Here they brought a picture of a rabbit. So the rabbit is lying on the floor. Um, the second picture is of them just exploring positive and negative space between their bodies and how it is, they can interact with each other. Um, on the left, we have a picture of a moped, a person riding a moped. So you see the wheels with the front handles, and um, the person in the orange is the person that was riding the moped. Um, in the top, you see that they are mimicking the picture that was on the museum board, and the bottom right picture is a bunch of bananas. <laughs> <laughs> These are a few of the students. Um, they just wanted to talk a little bit about um, their progress so far and what they've wanted to learn and what they've enjoyed um, so far in the dance group. But I can just go ahead and explain. So the first, um, the first student talked about how she was really excited to learn about the history of dance in the studio setting. They don't really teach that. Um, we touched on that a little bit, but here we can go a little bit more in depth. Um, the second student talked about how she always loved um, any kind of ballet technique, and she really wanted to learn how to dance on her toes, which we won't get to that because that is a skill level um, skill set that would be considered an advanced technique, and we will not get there with the first year. And then the third student just said that she was really excited to learn different techniques, different genres, was hoping to really get into hip hop. Um, so that's definitely something that I have a lot of to explore. All right, we'll move on. So, um, hopefully, we can come back and be here and talk. Obviously, this is an interactive study. We apologize. But, um, so, with my art students, we have 10 students um, out of 60 that tried out, presented a portfolio, did an on site drawing, along with um, an interview. Uh, then, third and fourth graders to only for 10 spots in our. It was pretty um, overwhelming to see the turnout, and I was beyond proud of the students who made it and the students who didn't make it, because I was surprised by some of their love of art that I teach daily and didn't know what was there. Um, so it was a really wonderful process. Um, and then as um, we approached and we got our 10, I had the privilege of sort of working on what's, what is this curriculum that we want? What is our goal here? So um, my goal is to help guide and shape students through the creative expression process and to develop a curriculum that challenges them beyond the classroom setting and wishes their artistic ability. Um, I wanted to broaden their scope or uh, broaden their scope of how and why art is even made, like to start thinking about the process because if they really have a love of it, it is um, an embedded thinking that you come up with. Why do artists make what they make is a hard question and answer. Um, and then to create an environment which allows the students to explore art 
all types of art materials and design concepts. So let's see what they have to say. Let's see. That's Casey, this is the Griggs's first year with GT Artistic, is it? Yeah. So what what is that like is we have seventy six kids come out in auditions. We ran three days of audition. I sit on the panel across um this is from our second school to um, be a part of Bethany's in their year three. Well, when I went to Nicole and um, actually asked Miss Greg and somehow Miss Henson was hiding in kindergarten and I said, hey, she said, I got somebody for dance. And, you know, that was a love. And so super excited to offer that in our own um, You know, that's the only opportunity. So really Bethany and Briggs to able to schools, uh, which is wonderful because they both be living it. So um, it's a real win for our kids. We super excited. Thank you. Also, the not be the I'm trying. Thanks for the I will tell you, um, I will talk about what they're going to talk about, which is kind of the unique experience. We are lucky enough to have five fourth graders and five fifth graders. That's okay. You can get it and we'll post it to it. Um, it's not going to work, so we apologize. Um, I will say this that the other thing that the sense and I are kind of excited about is it is a two year program. So our students that are in fourth grade automatically qualify for next year and then we'll go through the interview process again and sort of fill those other slots. And I know my fourth graders that I have now in my five are already planning for next year. What are we going to do different next year? What are we going to do the same? And that makes it really exciting. Um, I just think it's really exciting that these kids have the opportunity to learn it. I mean, just new techniques, new things that could inspire them throughout their daily lives. Um, a lot of people don't have access to the fine arts. So I'm just really excited to see how the program is. Thank you both for your leadership and the time you put into that. Great job. I hate we didn't get to see the videos. Thank you. 
And I know it's getting late for some of our kiddos in the audience. If you need to, to make an exit, please, please feel free to do so. We have a couple more presentations. Uh, the calendar is next uh, for, is it second reading? First, reading? first reading, first reading tonight, sorry. Thank you all. He might. He might. Go ahead, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Swain, members of the board. Uh, I'm here for a first reading on the calendar this evening. Uh, as we went through it, there's some uh, things that are required to hit. Uh, just quickly through those 180 days of construction, five working evening days, early to start the third Monday, and three bad weather makeup days that are required. Um, as we went through, I shared drafts with you. Uh, you see in red some changes. Um, the election day uh, in November is on there. Uh, we went through and, and making sure we had everything in there. Uh, we noticed that election day wasn't in there, so that is there. Uh, so that dropped that down. We had to do a couple of adjustments. Uh, you see, by the way, the bank of the is January 3rd. We moved to OEC day. There were some conversations with uh, with the OEC members and, and Dr. Quinn um, to where that date might be. So we moved it up. It's going to be either the 10th or the 17th, and we will have final confirmation of that before we have second reading in December. Uh, but you'll see some changes there. The, the main uh, structure of the draft hasn't changed. Uh, there's just uh, had to do one uh, day shift to uh, take and add a day off in, in November uh, for election day and then took a day out in the second, uh, second semester just to make sure we had those 180 days. So that's draft A. Did the same thing in draft B, added that election day on November 8th. Uh, and just made an adjustment placeholder to the 17th for uh, the OEC Professional Development Day. Uh, and then an adjustment to that one made a day and January um, on January the 13th. So those are the changes that have come into the drafts. Uh, they'll stay like that, share them with principals tomorrow morning the leadership so they can go off through all their building and get the full feedback that they do. Uh, we have that feedback from parents. Um, and we have had come back from the teacher form, and we'll go a little bit further uh, between first reading and second reading. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, uh, Dr. Hemingway has three policies that he wants to review. Here with Dr. Quinn, members of the board. Tonight, I'm presenting to you one policy for first reading and two administrative rules for first reading. The first uh, policy is the social studies policy. And what that policy does is outlines uh, the responsibilities of the district to provide social studies instruction. There was one change, and that's to include the Emancipation Proclamation as a part of that to be added. And then we have two rules. The first is IKFR, which is a graduation requirement rule. And what that rule does is it adds the Emancipation Proclamation to the examination requirements uh, and that work through that social studies uh, policy. And then the final is JICBA, which is a code of conduct rule. There were uh, two distinct things that happened in this, that, well, three things. One is added language for uh, campus disruptions for on campus and off campus. So those were two things that were distinguished as far as disruptive conduct, uh, any actions that were taken on campus or off campus. And there were two things added to uh, one to level two, which was the creating, uh, possession, and sharing of explicit images. And then for level three, knowingly and maliciously distributing um, images, exchanging images, and also solicitating images uh, that were explicit. And so those um, items are in your packet and on the PowerPoint that was presented to you with the highlights for the changes and the things that needed to be taken out of that policy for first reading. Are there any questions, comments, or suggestions for the one policy and the two administrative rules? Just one, uh, I guess, observation for the audience and the folks out there on are streaming it that it seems like sometimes we're we go through these rather quickly and unless there's some questions or thoughts of, but if you could just briefly um, explain how we go about reviewing these things in a work session, which is an opportunity for other folks to maybe come and participate and look at how those things are 
drill down to a lot more in detail and talk about specifically things that are changing and why. So that's an opportunity for anyone who would like to come. That's an open session and you have comments on that as well when some of these things are taking place. Sure. So first we've received the am I looking? <laughs> so first we received the updates from the school board association, which lets us know the legal ramifications that are uh, the, the legal policies that have been discussed over the summer for each of the, the policies that are changing. And so in our work session, we look at our current rules, our current policies, and we even do a markup to see what's been added from the school sports association and what's been taken out of the policy as language. And then there are also some considerations of things that we add in as a district that stay within those policies. So in a work session, we review those, we have a discussion, and we talk about the possibilities of the suggestions that are being made by the school boards association. And, and when we present it first read of that markup, that markup is based on the discussions that we've had in the work session, as well as the guidance that's been given to us by the school board association. So, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Hemingway? No. Which one was first read the policy? Yes, sir. The policy was, was first read in social studies. Which added emancipation proclamation. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, that concludes the superintendent's report tonight. It was a long report, but it was a great report full of great instructional things. Thank you to our schools and to our teachers and to all of our students. Mr. Williams, great job with your students tonight. Thanks for staying the full night. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. This concludes tonight's open session. Please travel safely home, and we we'll look forward to seeing each of you in our next meeting. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.